on the 3rd of October, 1785, a man appeared for trial in Kingston-upon-Thames, England, for the theft of three chickens. His name was James Bloodsworth, a master bricklayer and builder, a skilled artisan professional. Theft in England was a capital offence. As he awaited the verdict, James must have known that he was at risk of death, that he could soon be hanged publicly. However, the judge chose the alternative sentence, that of transportation for seven years. Transportation was essentially a combination of exile and forced labour. Convicts were sent to colonies to work, sometimes work to death. The traditional destination was Britain's American colonies, but this posed a problem in 1785 because the American War of Independence had only two years before come to an unsuccessful conclusion for Britain. So Britain's convicts were instead sent to the hulks, Britain's notorious prison ships where diet was poor, the labour hard, scurvy and other health conditions were prevalent, and the lash was a part of life. Come 1787, James Bloodsworth found himself in an entirely novel predicament. His time on the hulks was ended, and he was put aboard the ship the Charlotte with 123 other convicts, and they set sail from England. Their destination? Britain's new alternative to the prison ships, New South Wales, Australia. In this video, I want to take a closer look at the fate of convicts sent to New South Wales in the early colonial period. If you enjoy content about history, literature and politics, don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you. Thank you very much. In my video, The Birth of Australia, it was Arthur Phillip and other officers who took centre stage of the history. Here I want a convict's eye view. In particular, I want to shed light on who the convicts actually were, and I want to consider some assumptions about the brutality of convict life. When we think of penal colony, we think of suffering, forced labour, the lash, and these elements form part of the historical memory of the settling of Australia. But what if I told you that life in early colonial Australia could actually be pretty good? Let's return to James Bloodsworth's story and see. Arriving in January 1788 with the First Fleet, James Bloodsworth was immediately appointed Master Bricklayer of the settlement at Port Jackson, in what is now Sydney. Clearly, Governor Philip recognised the important skills James had and was sure to put them to good use. In this position, James had other convicts working under his direction. Most lacked his level of skill and experience. Governor Philip commended James with the patience with which he taught the skills of bricklaying and building to his charges. Despite the sometimes restless nature of the convicts, the lack of skill possessed by many of them, the food shortages that sapped their energy, the lack of suitable resources, James would give the new settlement its first public buildings. He was responsible for the construction, among others, of Government House, the official residence of the governors of New South Wales and the most potent early symbol of British civilization in Australia. The respect garnered by his good conduct, good character, hard work and contribution to life in the colony led to him being granted a pardon in 1790, two years before his sentence of transportation was due to expire. He was offered a chance to return to England. He refused. James had made a success of life in New South Wales. He married a convict woman, had four children, survived to adulthood, was granted land of his own to farm while also being superintendent of all brickmakers and bricklayers in the colony. His greatest honour was in 1802 becoming a sergeant of the Loyal Sydney Association, the colony's militia, and a position not always open to a former convict. He died of pneumonia in 1804 at the age of 45. James Bloodsworth's story is a happy one. He did work commensurate with his skills. He had other convicts working under his direction. Good behaviour led to his early parole and he received a grant of land. This was not the typical fate of convicts previously sent to the Americas or kept in the hulks in England. At least some convicts then were doing very well out of their exile. In fact, while James Bloodsworth did particularly well, most of the specific good fortunes mentioned, early emancipation, gaining property, were by themselves not exceptional. Let's take a moment to find out who were the convicts sent to New South Wales. The vast majority were sent for crimes against property, 
Crimes that we today might consider fairly minor, but in English law of the time, these crimes were capital offences and thus could be punished with hanging or transportation. Just over 60% of the convicts were English, 30% were Irish, just less than 5% were Scottish, with the remainder from Wales and various sprinklings of other nationalities. Based on the British and Irish population distribution of the time, this meant that the English were actually overrepresented as transported convicts. The Irish were about proportional to their share of the population, while the Scots were significantly underrepresented. This was reflective of the fact that in Scottish law, there were far less capital offences, so a Scot couldn't be transported for stealing chickens the way James Bloodsworth had been. Roughly reflecting the ethnic division of the population, approximately two-thirds were Protestant and one-third were Catholic. Among the English and Irish convicts, the origin of transportees were not evenly distributed across the home country. English convicts were predominantly from the east and south of the country while the Irish were predominantly from the east of Ireland, in and around Dublin. The English and Irish both were much more urban than the average for the country they were leaving. The transportees were for a long time castigated by historians as lazy, workshy members of an urban criminal class, the refuse of civilised society. However, more recent research has shown that compared to the national average of England and Ireland, the convicts had a higher literacy rate at about 75%. They also had a range of skills, from untrained labourers to professional artisans like James Bloodsworth, as well as artists, often convicted for forgeries, who painted many of the images used in this video, even the occasional clerk. They were also, generally, in the prime of their lives, with 80% aged between 16 and 35. Just over 10% of the convicts were women. The women convicts were very often described by contemporaries as prostitutes, or indeed, much less polite terms. It's worth noting that at the time, it was common to describe women living with a man out of wedlock as a prostitute. So we have to take the description with a pinch of salt. Women convicts punished for prostitution after arrival were usually actually just cohabiting with a man. By a long margin, most of the women just like the men, were transported for crimes against property. Interestingly, the women were disproportionately Irish, being roughly split equally between English and Irish. So imagine we had 10 randomly selected convicts in a room with us. Our sample could well be like this. Six would be English, three Irish, and one from just about anywhere, but quite possibly Scottish. One would be a woman, and there's a 50-50 chance that she's either English or Irish. Almost everyone is young and healthy, though a recent arrival is suffering scurvy from time spent on the prison hulks in England. Seven or eight of them can read. They have a wide selection of skills. Some unskilled laborers, sure, but also some artisans. There's a chance one of them is a clerk or an artist. They are urbanites, nearly all of them. Probably at least a couple from London and Dublin. They like the things that young, healthy urbanites like. Sport, drink chasing women, or indeed being chased. They aren't interested in work for work's sake necessarily, but some of them will make a success of things, and one of them will likely marry that one woman. This is the raw material out of which colonial Australia was made. In 1817, nearly 30 years after the founding of New South Wales, Lancelot Threlkeld arrived in Sydney full of sympathy for the plight of the convicts and with apprehension for the state of their souls. He was a missionary, and he hoped to bring God to both convicts and to the indigenous people alike. He requested a supply of Bibles from the British Bible Society, for giving to these white slaves as they were described by the British evangelical movement, of which Threlkeld was a part. In his spiritual mission to the convicts, Threlkeld was going to be very disappointed. His disappointment started when he intervened to stop a convict beating an Aboriginal woman. The consequence, quite reasonably, most contemporaries would have said, was that the convict was sentenced to 75 lashes. This caused Threlkeld no end of guilt. Threlkeld started a farm and missionary station on Lake Macquarie. As a free farmer, and according to the custom of the land, he was granted the employ of convicts by the government of New South Wales. What kind of white slaves did Threlkeld acquire? Initially, everything seemed okay, his first convicts being recent arrivals in the country and willing to work. 
However, he later got replacements of a rather different sort. These seven men were unwilling to work, or at least they were unwilling to work for Threlkeld. They were rude to him, they were lazy, they pretended to be less skilled than they actually were, and they told Threlkeld to his face that they wanted to be returned to the government. Probably they didn't like the undeveloped location of Threlkeld's farm, and hoped to be reassigned to somewhere with more opportunities for drink, part-time work, and women. Possibly, they found Thelkeld's efforts to save their souls irritable. While initially determined not to have men flogged, he ultimately gave in and did so. But these were not the white slaves of his imagining. He could not whip a man on a whim. Flogging was a serious legal matter. First, the local constable had to be called. Because of the distances involved, this took two days. Then the man to be flogged had to be sent to court, taking another three days. Only then, after being sentenced by the magistrate, could the man actually receive his punishment. And of course, all that time he was away, the convict was not working. Threlkeld tried other methods to discipline the convict workers. He withdrew their rations of the luxury goods that convicts in New South Wales had come to expect. Tea, sugar, tobacco. Once again, the attempt to bring them into line failed. One day, Thurkeld found a pile of beef dumped outside the door of the farm store. This was the convict's meat ration, meat being a major component of convict diet in New South Wales. It was dumped there because, so the convict said, it was too bony. Thurkeld implored them to take it, telling them it was exactly the same beef he and his family were eating. But they merely mocked him, saying they were giving it to him as a gift because they had already helped themselves to the pork kept in the store. Thurkeld gave up. He sent the seven men back to the government, which is exactly what they had wanted. Certainly, they would have been punished, probably sent to a road gang, some of the toughest work in New South Wales. But afterwards, they would have been reassigned to another private master, quite probably to somewhere more in line with their tastes. As for Threlkeld, he would instead focus on the spiritual plight of the aboriginals and leave the convict souls to God. Let's consider what we learn from Threlkeld's experience about convict life in New South Wales. Convicts worked either in government service or for private masters. In neither case were they purchased. When assigned to private masters such as Threlkeld, they never actually ceased to be the responsibility of the government. They couldn't be bought and sold as chattel slaves. If the private master didn't want them anymore, then they could only be sent back to the government. If the private master wanted to change or increase the number of convict laborers, then he had to apply for them to the government. In colonial New South Wales, the demand was always greater than the supply. The convicts, or government men, as they were often more politely referred to, knew themselves that they were valuable, and this gave them a surprisingly good position from which to negotiate. They knew many employers around New South Wales needed them. So what did they want? What could they negotiate for? First of all, luxury goods. Sugar, tea, tobacco. By the time Threlkeld arrived in New South Wales, these had become standard expectations of the convict workers. These were consumed in New South Wales in considerably greater quantities by convicts than by free workers back home in Britain. For a contented workforce, they were a must. Quality food was also demanded. As we saw, the convicts from Threlkeld's farm turned away beef that they considered below standard, despite Threlkeld's family themselves eating exactly the same meat, and they helped themselves to the pork instead. It wasn't just meat, though. Convicts also insisted on good white bread of the English style, and they got it despite the fact that much of the flour had to be imported. Colonial New South Wales had not made a great success of planting wheat. Farmers did indeed discover that maize grew very well on the land, so they could have all eaten cornbread or cornmeal at a much lower cost to New South Wales employers. But the convicts refused it. They considered it strange foreign food and they wanted proper bread. Now the poorer free farmers themselves ate maize to make ends meet, but that is to say that the convicts were actually often eating better than the free men. For that matter, amazing to think, they were eating a higher calorie intake than modern Australians or Britons. 
Of course, they did more physical labor than we typically do, but we can also compare with other forced labor and see that they were getting better than just about anyone, including American slaves. The fact is, the convicts were getting the particular kinds of food they had a taste for, and they were getting a lot of it. Food was important in another key way, as men assigned to private masters, but whose ultimate fate still rested with the government, the masters were legally required to make sure the workers were well fed. This made any protest about food a very sensitive matter for the masters because they knew that potentially their convicts could be taken from them if they could convince the government they weren't getting enough food. The third thing a convict worker wanted was free time. From the first days of British arrival, convicts had defended their own time, as they called it. What had begun as an expedient way to deal with the difficult early years of settlement had gradually become a conventional expectation. Regulations would vary over the decades of transportation, ultimately becoming increasingly restricted, at least in the urban centres, but it was always harder to stamp out in the countryside. What did they do with this free time? Drink rum, chase women if available, play sports, and work for wages. How's that for penal life? The absence of all those pleasures and advantages was no doubt a major reason for the frustration of Threlkeld's convicts. Being out in the bush as they were, they had less options for buying alcohol and less women. But the opportunity too for wages was of great value to convicts in New South Wales. When not working for their private masters, convicts would seek out other employers who needed the extra labour. And remember, because of the chronic labour shortage of New South Wales, such opportunity was virtually always available, as long as you didn't live too far from relative concentrations of population. Threlkeld's great sin in the eyes of his workers was dragging them into the bush where they couldn't make extra money. But this is forced labour, I hear you say. If they won't work or they make unreasonable demands, just get out your cat o' nine tails and flog them into submission. Many a convict master no doubt wished things were so simple. Unlike slaves or indentured labourers in America, the convicts belonged to the government, not to the masters to whom they were assigned. The masters had no right to hurt them himself, and in fact could suffer serious legal penalties if it were proved they had personally struck his convicts. The government reserved the right to physically punish convicts, and so a master wishing to have his worker flogged needed to go through a legal process to get it done. If he lived in Sydney, this could be reasonably quick, but if he lived on a farm out in the country, then this could take many days, during which time he had little recourse to get his convict to work. Estimates vary, but probably about a quarter of convicts were flogged at least once. Any amount of flogging is repulsive to modern people today, but this was not shocking for the time. In fact, the level of flogging in convict Australia was about comparable to that experienced by sailors in the British Navy, and was vastly less than that in the American slave plantations. One account of a Louisiana plantation records 66% of the men and 70% of the women being whipped. For all its notoriety, the lash was never such a prominent feature of colonial Australia. Other punishments could be used, and we've said already the master can't legally starve his convicts, but he can reduce their luxuries, those all-important tea, sugar, tobacco. This itself was risky and not always effective. Masters often found that they needed contented workers, give them their luxuries and their free time, and get at least some work out of them. Deny them these, and the convicts themselves can find ways to get away from you. They can drive you so up the wall that you send them back to the government. They can abscond or commit other offences and be punished by being taken back into government service. Now, the government could send them to road gangs. These gangs did an important service by developing the infrastructure of New South Wales at a cheap cost. The work was punishingly hard and was seen as a punishment for disorderly convicts. Sometimes convicts would flee into the bush and live as bushrangers, essentially bandits living off thievery. The lives of bushrangers typically ended badly, but in any case, a convict lost to bushranging or to a road gang was lost labour for the master. Overall, they found the carrot was more important than the stick. It was Threlkeld's inability to find ways to appease his workers that caused his problems. James Squire had been one of Samuel Bloodsworth's fellow convict passengers on the Charlotte 
Like him, he had been sentenced to seven years transportation, in his case, for highway robbery. Like Bloodsworth, he had talents that enabled him to turn his punishment into a successful life in a new country. Bloodsworth could build, James Squire could brew. His path to success was slower than Bloodsworth, who was able to demonstrate his value to the community on a remarkable scale while still a convict. James Squire's first years in New South Wales were not especially notable for good conduct, and he was once flogged for theft. However, he did start to practice brewing as a sideline business while still serving his sentence. After completing his term of transportation, he was awarded 30 acres of land as his own, in which he built a tavern and grew various crops, including hops, a first for Australia, and he became the primary source of beer for Sydney. He engaged in a number of businesses simultaneously, tavern keep, brewer, farmer, moneylender. He was widely liked and respected as a pillar of his community. The emancipist artist John Lissett recorded this about him. He was universally respected and beloved for his amiable and useful qualities as a member of society, and more especially as the friend and protector of the lower class of settlers. Had he been less liberal, he might have died more wealthy, but his assistance always accompanied his advice to the poor and unfortunate, and his name will long be pronounced with veneration by the grateful objects of his liberality. By the time of his death, Squire owned a thousand acres, and his descendants would be influential figures in Australia. His grandson, James Squire Farnell, would be elected as the first Australian-born Premier of New South Wales. From convict to political power in three generations. Not bad. The experiences of James Bloodsworth and James Squire were particularly successful. Of course, not all convicts could have their level of success, but nonetheless, their lives do highlight important points about convicts in New South Wales. There were no barriers put up to the economic advance of convicts once they had completed their terms of transportation. Convicts were sentenced to transportation for periods of seven years, 14 years, or for life. Very many of them, like James Bloodsworth, got some form of early release, often a form of conditional release called a ticket of leave, which means that they could live as free men but were not allowed to return to Britain until the full term of their sentence had expired. Few in any case would return to Britain, even when they acquired the right to do so. Part of the reason must be that opportunities were to be had in New South Wales. Emancipists, at least in the first decades of transportation, were usually granted land to work as free farmers. James Squire is an example of a man who made good use of his land grant. Of course, many failed. Indeed, Squire would acquire a thousand acres of land by the end of his life by purchasing the land grants of less successful farmers. But we shouldn't assume the sellers thus had an entirely economically unsuccessful life. As mentioned before, most of the convicts were urbanites, not suited to the land. They had urban skills. But the settlers also had urban tastes, so many convicts and emancipists ultimately settled on doing trades that they had trained for back in their home country. Whatever their industry, emancipists, now as free men, had the same right to be assigned convict labour from the government as anyone else. People were going from forced labour to being the masters of others in a very short space of time. Many went into business. Manchester man Samuel Terry was an example. Transported for stealing 400 pairs of socks, Terry would be the richest man in the colony by the time he died. While a convict, he managed businesses for the officer soldiers who were at that time socially dominant in the colony. Limited by social expectations that an officer cannot engage in trade, the officers employed men like Terry to conduct import businesses, most famously for rum, on their behalf. Later, men like Terry would carve out their own share of the market for themselves. In this respect, the lower social status of the convicts and the emancipists was turned into an economic advantage over their social betters.
Free settlers and the officer and administrative class would look down on the emancipists and would decline to invite them to social gatherings and dinners. But all the while, the emancipists overtook them in wealth. Ultimately, this economic power would be converted into political power. The first 80-odd years of Australian political history were very significantly determined by the political and social fault line between free settlers and the more numerous and sometimes wealthier emancipists. Slowly and with various stops and starts and changes in policy, the emancipists clawed ever greater influence over life in New South Wales. And as we've already seen, their descendants would quickly reach the highest levels of political power that colonial life afforded. Convict, forced labour, penal colony. The images these words bring to mind are universally negative. I hope in this video I've demonstrated that our feelings about these words can obscure our understanding of life in colonial Australia. It would certainly be possible for me to compile a collection of stories of the worst, most horrible and brutal stories of convict life. Tales of abuse, floggings, vicious overseers and cruel masters. These stories do exist. If you check the sources in the description, you can find them. But that people can be very cruel to each other does not seem to me at least a very remarkable point that needs demonstrating. What is remarkable is just how good life generally was for the transportees to Australia. In England, transportation was attacked from the beginning in two opposed currents. On the one hand, it was attacked as cruel a form of slavery akin to that in America and Britain's Caribbean colonies. I hope I have demonstrated that the comparison is false. The other current opposed to transportation had a much better case to make, in my opinion. The complaint was that the transportation to Australia was unjust because rather than punishing criminals, it rewarded them. In so doing, it also failed to deter criminality in Britain. The convicts were better fed. They had a lower mortality rate and a lower rate of sickness than their friends left at home. They arrived with no property, yet were allowed to make money while still convicts and then granted land to be their own after their sentence. Their children grew up taller and healthier than those in England and Ireland. They enjoyed the luxuries of sugar, tea and tobacco far beyond your average Londoner. Their children and grandchildren would become the leaders of the society they built. Their descendants inherited a remarkable country. Some punishment. I was born and reared in Lincoln Town, well, Stratton is my name. And if you listen to my tale, I'll tell you what my shame. For the memories of my home so dear They're all to no avail For I am the transportation To the shores of New South Wales